Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's well here on, uh, on a real cold Wednesday by St. Pete's standards. My name is Rick Stiff. I work St. Pete Fire Rescue. Uh, and for a number of years, uh, we've been presenting uh, disaster preparedness for small businesses. Uh, in, in, and it's become kind of a hard sell uh, because we haven't had anything going on around here for so many years. The hurricanes seem to skirt us. Uh, major catastrophes seem to avoid us, um, but nevertheless, today my hope is that after we spend about the next 40 minutes or so breezing through this material, that you'll all leave with a belief that along with all the major considerations you have put in to your entrepreneurial efforts, you know, the, the, the issues about capital and inventory and marketing, all these different topics, you'll manage somehow to wedge in a little emergency preparedness or proactive disaster planning so that you don't become one of about the 47 or so percent of small businesses that do not survive big emergencies, big disasters like hurricanes, okay? We want you up, we want you back doing your thing, in a resilient manner. That's our goal. Um, so what we'll do today is we're going to move quickly through kind of what the city does. But we're going to take what the city does in terms of disaster planning and what have you and whoosh it out of the fire department and away from 250,000 people in this peninsular county of ours and try to pull it in to a small business entrepreneur, okay? Nothing too particularly uh, sophisticated about it. It's very straightforward. Your questions are absolutely appreciated. We, uh, we uh, can talk or emphasize any area you wish. So please feel free to do that. And with that, I am indeed probably the only time the city will stiff you. Let's hope I'm the only time the city will stiff you. <laughs> That's correct, I'll be here all week. All right, here's our phone number down here. It may be in some of your materials, but you can get us at 892, hey, look at that, I can scribble, I better be careful. 892-5200, uh, and we're at your service. If you're out there preparing this thing or you've got it done and you go, I wonder if, does this make any sense? You can email it to me if you want. Uh, if you'd like for us to come out to your business, some afternoon at 2 o'clock and tour your, your uh, business and, and, and do it at that, we, we're at your service. So please, uh, uh, dial us up if it's, uh, if it's convenient for you. Okay. Moments ago I was trying to make a case for business disaster preparedness, and I certainly want to emphasize that. Behind me is kind of a short list of reasons why it may become very, very uh, important for you. Uh, in terms of mitigating or lessening the impact of major disasters. And I would add at this point, as we meet here today, police, fire, and other first responders are dealing with a number of calls out in our general community, surrounding areas. What we're talking about here today as we get into this, of course, are that basket of calamitous events the big ones, the 9-11s, the Hurricane Sandys, Hurricane Charlies, um, swine flu that we were very fortunate. It didn't make people particularly really sick, but they had some flus earlier in the previous century that killed nearly everybody that got them, kind of like this Ebola thing that's going on in West Africa. So. Those are what we're talking about. These are, these are ones that can, can set you back in a big way. But a little bit of planning, and you can really avoid much of that. The good news is, if you, all this stuff, all these different titles and things that you will hear, if you Google this, the good news is there's about 7 trillion locations where you can get really good information. Little templates, all sorts of guidance to kind of amplify or uh, fill you in a little better than perhaps I do today. 
The bad news is there's so many of them, you probably have to mine for a little while to find one that really fits. But I've never found bad information on the internet about business continuity planning or business disaster planning. There's some tremendous sites out there that'll pop right up at the top of the list for you. They all mean the same thing. Planning so that if one of these events occurs, you'll be able to keep on going and, or get back up on your feet quite quickly. First thing we do over in the fire department when we talk about the city's disaster planning is we talk about gaining situational awareness that helps us to make assumptions. And what that really means is, just hypothetically, you talk about a hurricane, for example, and you think or you try to project what kind of conditions and circumstances and events are going to occur when that happens. And we kind of we have a pretty good picture of that. We've been frightened before. Charlie came up the coast. We kind of know that, that whole ordeal. Uh, we can empathize a bit with the folks up in New York when Sandy hit them. We've had tropical storms dump 15 inches of rain. Uh, trying to remember the one we had that hit the corner of Pasco County several years ago and gave them about 23 inches up there. I'm going to say Debbie. I think that was a tropical storm. But anyway, but you sit down and you kind of go, what will the business conditions be like? If Charlie had actually hit Pinellas County and not Charlotte County, what would business conditions be like? Well, Rick, what, are business, what business conditions are you talking about? Well, how about communications? Would cell phones have been working? Would there have been fuel for vehicles? And if so, when would that have ran out? Would it have ever ran out? Would there have been shortages? How about getting up and down the highway? There are projections for a Category 3 storm that there would be $120 million of debris clearance in the city of St. Petersburg, just to clean things up. $120 million. Wow. Time frames. Would the city be in the dark ages for a week, a month, more than that? So we make these kinds of assumptions and we try to gain some situational awareness. That's the, the word we use. And you have to do the same thing for your business. All your businesses, all your, your, your uh, operations are different. Some are based on transportation. Some are based on manufacturing. Some are based on your expertise. OK? All right. How will stakeholders in my business behave? What kind, how will they behave, indeed, in chaotic circumstances? OK? We had a drill, not a drill, I'm sorry, but we had an exercise the other day where we just sat around, we called it a tabletop, and we just sat around and we tried to work our way through a very virulent <coughs> pandemic episode where there was more than a thousand fatalities in the county and thousands of people requiring hospitalization. And the absentee rate at any given employer was running about 50%. Well, on the city side, we're saying, oh, holy moly, how do we continue to patrol the streets, suppress fires, provide emergency medical care? <laughs> on the business side, how's that going to affect you guys? Think of yourself, and I often tell folks, as a business, think of yourself as the hub of a wheel, and you have these spokes going out in all directions. At the end of those spokes, are your stakeholders all around you, customers. You know what I'm talking about. You've got all these different folks. In terms of situational awareness, you have to kind of have an understanding of how you believe they'll behave. Will they deliver? Will they service? Will they want your goods and services? Those types of things. OK. I just transportation, safety, security, or some things. And once you get a situational awareness, say, OK, I get it. For my business, I get it. We move on, and we go to step number two. And that's what we call a HIRA, a Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. And in emergency management, folks, I hate to tell you, we get paid by the acronym. Okay, So each time that I spew out an acronym, I get a nickel. 
Okay, so there'll be a few of them, but I'll try to explain each and every one of them to you. The first one is a HIRA, Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. And here's a very simple algebra here, but it can really be of use to you. The first one is think of your business and think of an asset that you have. An asset could be your employees, subcontractors, partners, an asset. It could be property, tangible, intangible items. It could be information. It could be a database, company records, okay? An asset. People, property, information, anything is an asset. But in disaster preparedness, we're, we want to protect those. We don't want those to be, you know, permanently damaged or destroyed. We want to protect them. And what do we protect them from? Well, we protect them from a threat. What is a threat? Well, a threat can be many things. There's man-made threats that are deliberately caused by humans. In fact, if you go down through this list, all these, except for Mother Nature, could almost be caused by humans if they tried hard enough. But there's man-made, deliberately caused, like terrorism, a civil disturbance, there's man-made, techno-human-caused. Man coupled with an airplane, you end up with a terrible crash. Man coupled with hazardous materials, hazmat incident, a power outage, and one of my favorites, a maritime disaster. You have natural, mother nature, hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, earthquakes. And the last one, and I can't say it very well, I'll give it a try. Epidemiological. Not, not too bad for an Irishman. All right. Public health, pandemic influenza, Ebola, SARS. These are threats. There's others. The list kind of goes on forever. How about the loss of a key staff member? What if you have a business and you've got a partner in there, somebody working for you, and they really are, you know, an all-star. You lose them, you lose a lot. So there's lots of hazards. And those hazards threaten what? Our assets. Now we move on. Assets, threats. We move on to the final one here, and that's a vulnerability, is a weakness in our protection efforts. At Rick's Flower Shop, I have a big inventory of fresh flowers in a reefer. Hurricane strikes. I have a backup generator. So I'm able to get continuous refrigeration to those flowers. No vulnerability, is there? But what if I don't have a backup source of power? Those refrigerated flowers are in, indeed vulnerable. Okay. You can apply that to three limousines in your limo business, to your chi tree chipper, uh, your Asplund tree tripper, chipper uh, in your tree uh, trimming business. A weakness, a vulnerability is a weakness or a gap. It can be exploited by those threats and damage, destroy, gain unauthorized access to one of our assets. And finally, you just put it together. It's very simple. The intersection of A or the sum of an asset, a threat, and its vulnerability, if it indeed exists, you sum those up and you get R for risk. The process is called a HIRA. And we go through this for all our buildings in the city. We do this for our infrastructure, for all the assets of the city. You should take a moment to do it for all the assets of your entrepreneurial efforts, of your business. And indeed, if the risk, your call, you're running the show, if the risk is substantial, then it merits your attention. In planning, in capital investment, maybe a little of both. If it's minimal and you're willing to undertake it, that's part of the fun of your job. That's your call, as are all of these. Okay?
So we do some situational awareness, and then we do a HIRA, and then we move on to the plan. We know some assumptions. We, know, we think we know how things are going to unfold. We know our risks. Now we move on to the plan. That's Rick's Flower Shop, as I mentioned, threat to the flowers. Getting that capability took away that risk, having that alternate source of uh, power for the reefer. Okay, this has been called Rick's Elephant. Uh, I'm just appreciative that it's not been called worse. Uh, but here is what your emergency preparedness plan for a small business should kind of look like. It has five elements, and we're going to go through them very quickly. Communications, of course, is in the middle because it touches all of them. It, 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 it engulfs all of them, okay? You say, well, Rick, how long is this thing supposed to be? I'm not going to write war and peace. don't have time for that. That is true. Depending on your business, your plan could be on one page. It could be on one disk. It could be on one, one thumb drive. It could be 20, 30 pages long. We have a financial uh, 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 giant, uh, global uh, presence in St. Petersburg. Their plan is this thick, and it needs to be that thick. Yours can touch all the bases probably in two or three, four pages. Rick's Flower Shop would be about three pages, and I'm going to tell you what ought to be in it. Su not tell you, suggest to you. Okay? Here we go. First thing. Emergency response plan. City has an emergency response plan for everything because we have an all-hazard plan. It's supposed to apply to everything. It comes down the pike. You need to have kind of an emergency response plan, too. If that hurricane is indeed coming up from Cancun late in the season and working its way up paralleling the coast, just when are you going to pull the trigger on getting your act together for it to the degree that you need to? Eight hours out? 24 hours out, when they do a watch, a warning, when it's too late, okay? We'll give it a little, <clears throat> excuse me, give it a little thought. This is your emergency response plan. The emergency is an approaching storm. The emergency is a terrible hazmat incident that they've put yellow tape around your flower shop. You drive in, 7.30 in the morning, what in the world is going on here? Uh, who are you? Well, I own this place. It's Rick's Flower Shop. Well, we had a terrible hazmat incident here last night, about 2.30 in the morning. We have phenyl glycobacamol all over the place. And you're going to have to stay out of that area. It's contaminated at this. Well, I got to get into my flower shop. Well, you're not going to get in today. Well, when? We don't know. Stand back, sir. Things like that pop up. Reentry or reaccess to your property and to your business after a disaster is a, probably a bit of a class on its own. After Hurricane Ike in Texas, they wouldn't let anybody back into the Bolivar Peninsula. Those Texans are rough, rough folks sometimes. They showed up about the third day with their squirrel guns and told them, if you don't let us back into our houses, we'll just take it. We'll deal with it. So all the officials on all the vehicles with light bars got together and decided, well, maybe they ought to be able to go back because each day we keep them out, whatever they could save is mildewing. They're going to lose everything. So each storm, each catastrophe, tends to give us lessons to learn, and that certainly was one from Ike on reentry. Those of you who have business interests in St. Pete but live in Brandon or live in Clearwater need to kind of take that into consideration. After a hurricane they may pretty well cordon off the city for a while to keep folks from coming in and doing bad things. Well I don't intend to do that. How would I get into town? Well you're going to have to produce some, some identification at a checkpoint out here on Gandhi someplace or on 19. So just a thing to, to think about. Mercy response plan. How am I going to, what steps am I going to take, time frames. 
What methodical move forward am I going to take to make sure I'm prepared for a storm, uh, prepared for, uh, 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 to respond to just about anything that happens? You want to protect your people, your property, include evacuation, sheltering in place. If I were to come to your business this afternoon in my bunker gear and run that door open and say, attention to everyone, shelter in place, I'll advise when clear. Would you know what I just said? Would it make any sense to you? Probably not. What I'm telling you is, don't run out into this plume of noxious gas. Just relax. Close the door, go over and turn the fans off, and everybody just relax for about 20 minutes, and I'll stick my head back in and say, the stuff has dissipated, we're good to go. Sheltering in place. Okay. <laughs> Plans should include evacuation, as well as other types of threats. Okay, we got you, Rick. Hurricane preparations, very simple. Fire evacuation, safety plan. At Rick's Flower Shop, there's three of us. Me, a full-time worker, and a part-time helper. We know that if the place blows up and we can get out of there, we're going to meet at the bus stop across the street. That's how we'll know all three of us got the devil out of the building. Hopefully, you've got something simple like that at your business. And at home, too, for that matter. Procedures for shutting off your utilities. Flood preparation procedures, and we'll have a little antidote on floods here at the end. Alternative locations. The city has an emergency operations center. But if for some reason we can't get in there, we have an alternate. And if for some reason the alternate is unsuitable, we've got a really poor uh, alternate alternate, but we've got them three deep if we need them, okay? Well, if you can't get back in to your jewelry shop or to your art gallery, do you have another location from which you could do some business? If you sell some art objects and everything, do you have an alternative location? Protection of critical equipment, protection of your property, Protection of critical information, oh my goodness. And how will you manage the incident? Moving quickly, direction and control. It's a very militaristic term. What it simply means is, who's going to call the shots? Who's going to make the decisions? At Rick's Flower Shop, I may not be able to get in. Our plan, however, is that my partner, a person I trust tremendously, Dave. I'm going to let Dave make all the decisions he wants to make until I can get there. Or maybe you don't have that luxury and you tell someone you're going to open up and you can, you know, sell things, but don't you buy a, don't, you know, don't obligate any money. So you can have all sorts of different ways. It's your business and you call the shots. But that's direction and control. Delegation of authority. I think in the city, the mayor goes six deep. If the mayor's not available, no. If they're not available, no. Well, I don't think you need to go six deep. But you get the gist. Okay. Direction and control. A system's needed to define responsibilities and coordinate activities before, during, and following an incident. Hurricane Ike was a, was a real, real great storm I feel so sorry for those folks in Texas, but it sure gave a lot of lessons. One of those colleges, uh, universities in Texas, uh, found out that, uh, that the businesses that had gone over a plan with the employees about expectations and about what the, what the master plan was for a hurricane got tremendous success on getting back up and operational and rocking and rolling again. Those who had never discussed it couldn't find their employees. The employees did not feel an overwhelming obligation to come back to work. And so they, they experienced a lot of difficulties. But you want to define responsibilities and coordinate before, during, and following the incident. Let your folks know what your, your expectations are and you'll get maximum return. All right. Succession of authority, delegated. Employee roles, expectation. Indeed. All right. 
Moving quickly, now we're into resource management. That's what we call the city of St. Petersburg in the aftermath of a hurricane. I, I don't, I learned very quickly in this class. I asked some folks, I think maybe the second class, to give me some on what they were doing. Well, not being that big a capitalist, I was soon figured out that they didn't want to tell me anything. Everything they had in their head was proprietary. And so, after I realized that, I don't ask people what they're into anymore, okay? Interesting evening that night. Why is everybody withholding from me? Uh, but the city will need literally everything. So I don't know what you're all into, but I know this. I bet you a happy meal that we would need something from you, all of you, okay? And with that, I would say that you need to get yourself, if you haven't already, get yourself hooked up with our purchasing department and make sure you're on their ledger and you're available to be contacted uh, uh, and available to do things for us after, before, during, or after a hurricane or another calamity. And that same goes for probably the major governments in the county, like Pinellas County Government, Clearwater, Pinellas Park, Largo, those folks who you can get hooked up with. All right, resource management. Very simple, getting the things you need before, getting the things you need after. Very simple, but it can come fraught with a lot of problems. First, you have to identify, what am I going to need? What's real critical? At Rick's limo service, what's really, really critical? Yes. Indeed, sir. <laughs> Fuel. And probably a whole lot of tires. Okay, well that's critical. Some of that other stuff's not, but that's critical. What's critical for you? And where are you gonna get it? Where are you gonna get it? I had a uh, gentleman involved with uh, an oil company here in the Bay Area who had a long-standing relationship with the city, years. Called me frantically one Friday afternoon. I was the only guy in the office, and he was fired up. He had gone over to the tank farm in Tampa to fill up his tank truck and take it right down to Joe Kreisen over at Fleet in the city, fill our tanks, because there was a tropical storm, I believe it was Fay, that was buzzing around, scaring everybody. And we wanted to get our city fuel tanks filled. When he got over there, they told him to go to the back of the line. He goes, wait a minute. I'm getting fuel here to fill up police cars in St. Pete. We don't care. This tank farm belongs to a multinational oil company, and they've shut down Port Everglades, Florida, in Miami, and there's no more fuel coming into Miami. Therefore, all these trucks in front of you are going to fill up and go down and sell it at convenience stores in Miami-Dade. And we'll get to you when we can. Oh my goodness, what a blinding example of the obvious, okay? This is how it operates in the abnormal, okay? Fuel for public safety vehicles got put at the back of the line. That's how illogical some of this stuff begins to work under these circumstances. Okay, enough anecdotal stuff. Equipment, services, real property, supplies, you may want to make sure you have redundancies for these. I can get the equipment I need from Acme Equipment. Well, what if they, you know, what if they don't answer the phone? Well, you need to have a backup. When we're talking about hurricanes, you need to have redundancies. Okay? Don't be afraid to, to, uh, uh, to go deeper than just one, one entity. Okay? Emergency response plan. What are you going to do? Who's going to call the shots? What will I need in resources to make this work, to make me survive? And we get the communications, and of course, we had to get there. It's really kind of the big one. It encompasses everything. And again, the hub and the spokes. At the end of those spokes are people you're going to have to maintain contact with. Okay? Cell phone infrastructure each year becomes more and more uh, robust. 
If we were having this conversation 10 years ago, I would say, oh boy, you know, help us. We probably not get cell coverage around here for weeks. But they've done a tremendous amount of work in getting uh, uh, cell phone towers and portable tower, getting that infrastructure up. They want, they want service. They want us to be paying customers using their, their systems. So now we talk about a hurricane and we talk maybe two to, two, two to four days, three to five, in terms of uh, interrupted cell phone use. But there is light at the tunnel, and that is even when those cell phones don't seem to work too well, the texting function generally punches through. I'm not an IT guy, okay, but I'm told that kind of a different modality and texting pushes its way through. So, but you need a communications plan. How would you get a hold of down at the flower shop? Your right arm guy and your part time, how would you get a hold of them? I guess you don't. And ergo, no plan can be a plan. If you just capitulate and say, hey, I'm going to move forward without contacting my people for 48 hours. I'll build that into the plan. If I can get to them earlier, great. But I'll assume and build into my plan that I can't get to anybody for 48 hours. Okay. I had someone in here to, uh, some time ago. The employees of their business, there was just a handful of them involved, all tended to live in the kind of the near north central part of St. Petersburg. How neat. It's almost like a neighborhood group. And what their plan was, was to go to the main library after the storm and post notes, pin notes on a big tree there. I will be here, I'm Dave, I will be here tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Dave to Mary, Tom, Larry, I will be here tomorrow at 1. They show up at any time in the interim, oh, well, maybe we'll come back tomorrow at 1. They meet. That was their plan. Sound, works for them. Works for them. Communication plan. Your uh, clients, your customers, will stay with you a, su a surprising loyalty if you communicate with them. If after a storm you don't get to them, they will find other sources for their stuff. But if you tell them, I'm down but I'm not out, it'll be a week or two, it'll be a month, but I've got stuff coming in from Chicago, we're going to be ready to go. Tremendous loyalty. They have a business relationship with you and they don't want to go anywhere else. But you've got to let them know. Got to keep them in the loop. Keep those people at the end of the spokes in your communication plan. Additionally, in terms of communications, you can go to the to the Pinellas County website and you can go down through your menu and hit emergency management. When you click on it and read a little bit down in one of the columns, you'll find out that for nothing, for three minutes, you can get all hooked up to all sorts of warnings and notifications that'll essentially give you the same ones we get. Okay for free, please do that. Please do that. If, they, if you're following a storm, but you get completely engulfed in taking care of that flower shop, and a warning is issued, and you find out about that warning, the warning says that you're going to have hurricane conditions. I get it mixed up all the time. They changed it on me. 36 hours, then... You know, and eight or ten hours of that time goes by and go, oh, geez. I didn't know about this until you get home and watch Paul Delgado. Then you're behind the eight ball. Okay? Use that that's available to you. Warnings and notifications. Okay. So there we have. We have one left. The recovery. The recovery. A plan to implement and initiate after the fact. 
but you want to contain it, you want to stabilize the damage you have, you want a continuation, and you want to move towards a return to normalcy in your, uh, your business. Easier said than done, but it can be done. You'll need to conduct, perhaps, a damage assessment. Remember we talked about our assets? Well, how have they been affected? The flowers are dead. The reefer is smashed. I had three feet of water in this building. I can see the high water mark. How about your insurance information? Each year, you should become an expert on your insurance coverage. My wife handles insurance in my family because she used to work in the insurance business. I delved into my property, my homeowner's policy. I'd never been so surprised in my life. Every time I read something, I go, well, you know what I said. Can't repeat it here. Well, you need to make sure that that, that, that knowledge, that expertise about your insurance coverage, uh, uh, that you've got a real grasp on that. I would, I would really urge you to make sure that takes takes uh, uh, a high priority. Understand beforehand the individual and SBA assistance programs. Now, individual, we call it individual because that's for you, not your business. Okay? There's all sorts of disaster aid in our great nation. When they use the word individual, they're talking about you and your family. When they talk about public assistance, they're talking about us. Build a bridge repair the skyway, the drainage systems, okay? Build a new library. When they talk about SBA, and you'll be, we'll be moving into that here very shortly, we're talking about Small Business Administration's Disaster Assistance Program, which means capital for you, okay? So you need to know, you need to have a knowledge. Knowledge is power, ladies and gentlemen, and you need to know about it. Sources of vital goods, we talked about that in the resources alternates, timelines, and critical paths. How long do you intend to be in recovery mode? Can you do it in a week? Can you do it in a month? Well, that's up to you. Permitting and licenses, oh my goodness. The folks over in the city in, in permitting, uh, construction and all that, uh, have all sorts of plans to get out and be accessible, uh, waive fees, to try to get all of you into repairing your property and getting it back up, making homes habitable after the storm. Well, if you have an understanding of that process, you can take full advantage of those, uh, of those uh, processes. And I mentioned the government, government contractor connection. Okay, be mindful to separate your business from personal affairs. The IRS just loves to find people who use their home as their office and then drive them crazy in the process of dividing what part of the house is actually used for business, you know, all this guy. They love that. They get degrees in that stuff. So you want to make sure that you, if, if that's your case, that you separate your business <laughs> operations from your personal affairs. Set realistic time frames, a little bit of progress each day. Don't come out into the terrible aftermath of a hurricane and go, well, I'll take care of this before Friday. You'll be terribly disappointed. Communicate constantly with the stakeholders and look for opportunities to mitigate future risks. If that water did indeed run through your flower shop three feet deep, then you, when the time permits, you really need to sit down and say, do I, you know, can I tolerate this on an annual basis? There is, anybody in here a gamer? Anybody in here like to go to Vegas once in a while? I guess I'm the only one. All right. When you delve into gambling and probabilities and odds and all that, you find out that it's all based on a universe of random results, which means that if you pull that slot machine and you get a jackpot, the odds of you pulling it a next time and getting a jackpot again are the same as they were when you pulled it the first time and won. That's hard to get your head wrapped around a little bit. 
But that's essentially the deal here. And we haven't had a storm of any magnitude for 100 years, essentially, 1921. But we could have one every year or two in one year. There's that terrible map from 04 or 05, huh, how the years go by. That's got five storms on it all at one time. So, okay. Communicate, look for opportunities to mitigate. Checklists are a wonderful thing, especially when you're my age, okay? But what people tend to do with checklists when they put them into their disaster planning is they get kind of myopic and they get focused on them and they forget I'm responsible for the 360 degrees of this business. So use them, exploit them, but don't let them, don't, don't let them creep in and begin to run you. Review, practice, and rehearse. I would suggest that you pull your little plan out or review it on an annual basis. Update contact information. Maybe when the clocks change. How about November and May? Those are good uh, hurricane uh, benchmarks. Review critical business information annually. Contracts, financing, services, and leases. If you have folks that work at your business, have a learning lunch. Get a pizza or two and a big bottle of pop and sit around and go over your plan in, in May and say, we're coming up on the storm season, let's go over this. Conversely, you may want to keep that plan to yourself, and there's good reasons for that, very good reasons for that. You call the shots. And then after all this, you may want to conduct a little tabletop or drill exercise of your own. And Chief Ballou and I are available to come out and for a styrofoam cup full of coffee, we'll work with you on it too. Okay, that's our, uh, that's our price. And now the kicker, our new slide here. The city's involved with a number of initiatives uh, to try to make sure everybody uh, in, in, in St. Petersburg, in our area, and particularly those who interact with the city, uh, get uh, some information or get an, an awareness and a sense, sensitivity check to some of the flood hazard awareness. For your home and for your business, can you guys tell me what, not your evacuation zone for a hurricane, although you should know that, but do you know what flood zone, national flood zone you live in? I see some nodding, that's outstanding. Okay, well you, you can find it, just look it up, go to the internet, plug it in, and they'll tell you, zone A, zone E, zone X. As you can imagine, with a maximum elevation in St. Petersburg of 41 feet above sea level, that's our Pike's Peak, okay? There's a lot of vulnerable floodplain areas in the city, okay? Ensure your business assets accordingly. Now you can go down to a carrier and you can get a wind policy for the hurricane, okay? But does that, did you hear the operative word wind? Does that wind policy cover the three feet of water that washed through on the storm surge down there on uh, Pinellas, Pinellas Point where my little flower shop's at? Did it cover that? Did it cover that? Protect people and property from your floods? Sure, it's all tied into hurricane awareness. Build and remodel responsibly too. Protect natural floodplain functions. So there's your flood hazard awareness sensitivity check. We add that on as the city wants to make sure that, uh, that we put that out there and give you an awareness of it. With all the news we've had about flood insurance around here, uh, that's kind of a natural, one of the natural consequences of that. Okay, let's review very quickly. Why have a business disaster plan? Because it will make, it will contribute to making your business resilient and you'll be ready to rock after a disaster. Essential preparatory step is that HIRA. What are some important elements? Well, we went through five. 
Response, recovery, communications, resources, and which one did I miss? Communications, did I say that one? Recovery? Yeah, there they are. Name three resources you can use in your business continuity plan. You can go to the internet, go to Florida Department of Emergency Management. You can go to FEMA, they really are not evil. <coughs> and the very best, really, the Small Business Administration. You are going to be so wowed when you find out about how the Small Business Administration works with small businesses in these matters. The need for your business to be resilient, hazard identification, we said the five, embrace lifelong preparedness. Your competition is, it's like that old thing the coach told you, we need to practice practice because our opponents are. Well, your competitors in the business world are working on their disaster plan today, figuratively. Okay, We want you to have a good plan, to give it that thought, to contemplate, to get a situational awareness, to still it, make it yours, your product, get it written down to where you can capture it, get at it after, afterwards, and then apply it. Because the goal here is for you to continue to make a profit, to be viable. We don't want New Orleans, poor New Orleans, all the merchants left, many did not come back. We want you up and ready to go. The city will need you. Your community will need you. Pinellas County will need you. We want you to be ready to answer the call. You've been very attentive. I appreciate it very, very much. Phone number was on that first one. I think you've got some printouts of these slides. Give us a call. Hell, we haven't had any storms to deal with this year. I'd appreciate a little, little action. So don't be afraid to, uh, to get a hold of us. We'll, we'll stop by or talk or you can send something for us to look at. We'll be glad to help. Okay? And I thank you very, very much. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Robert Savarria. I'm the senior area manager for SBA for nine counties around Tampa Bay. And today we're going to be speaking about disaster loan programs. Okay, I know that uh, all of you are excited to find out about disaster loan programs because I'm asking the question, why are you here? You're here because you want to get certified for the city of St. Petersburg, is that correct? You're here actually because not only is certification, which is a requirement for you for, for, uh, to attend this workshop, but you're also here to learn about how you can plan for disaster survival and come back and help the recovery and make a profit. The advantages to the city and other suppliers is that you're learning about a disaster recovery plan that Rick went over with you. With all the advantages he covered about being prepared. <clears throat> the advantage to the city is that they will have responsible contractors like yourself that can learn how to write a continuation of operations plan a disaster recovery plan so that you can, in case of a disaster here, you can evacuate the area but keep operating, keep your business operations going. You keep your business operations going and you come back and you help with the recovery and based on what products or services you provide, those products or services are going to help you to make a profit, to do business with the city, or just your general uh, customers, your clients, your other buyers of your product or services. So you're here to, to become, have that extra tool in your toolbox to learn how to survive and come back, help with the recovery, and make a profit. Because that's what you're in business for, right? Anybody not here in business to make a profit? Okay, we can cover that. So uh, we'll go over our loan programs, but Rick covered a lot of great information for you to consider in preparing your business 
for disaster recovery. And I'll touch on some of those uh, topics uh, that he discussed when it, uh, I think it applies to uh, the, the situation where you'd be applying for a disaster loan from SBA. Now, disaster loan from SBA is direct loans from the federal government. They're not like our business loans, okay? Now, a lot of the requirements are the same. Some of those requirements are good credit, ability to repay the loan, collateral if you have it, and cash on hand. But we'll cover some of these things as we go. Now, for a business loan, if you're going to apply for a business loan or uh, one of the workshops that's also required for certification, especially for construction, is surety bonding. If you're going to uh, uh, be able to get, obtain surety bonding for your company, if your customers require surety bonding. So we have a guaranteed surety bond program as well. So we'll go ahead and start with the presentation and uh, we'll uh, cover some of those topics that are not on my slideshows, uh, but we'll uh, do our best to inform you about disaster loan programs by SBA. Now, SBA has a totally complete part of the agency is dedicated to disaster recovery and SBA loan programs, okay? <clears throat> So the types of disasters, and Rick alluded or spoke directly about some of these events, like hurricanes. That's what we normally think about when we think about disaster, right? An earthquake in other parts of the country, wildfires, tornadoes, OK? It just as well could be a drought, or it just as well could be an oil spill, or it just could be, or just, it could be uh, another event like 9-11. 9-11 happened, and we did a lot of disaster loans here in Tampa and Florida because 9-11 caused people not to fly, people not to go on vacation. The tourists didn't come to Florida. So our, our economic, uh, economic loan programs covered that situation, so we made a lot of loans to businesses that were in the tourist industry and other related industries uh, that were affected by that event. Hurricane Katrina, and Rick spoke about Hurricane Katrina, right? Everybody knows about Hurricane Katrina, caused by a hurricane by flooding in part of New Orleans. So this is the damage that was caused by Hurricane Katrina. Now we were there to help. This is a, one of the biggest events where SBA contributed a lot by providing maximum amount of loans made to the residents of New Orleans because of Hurricane Katrina. <clears throat> the oil spill. Everybody remember the oil spill? Once in a while, we'll have a tar, bar, tar, tar ball rolling up on the beach, right? So we don't know what effects will be out there for for um, uh, because of that disaster, but uh, we made economic injury loan program loans even to businesses that were not up in, in the north and the panhandle of Florida or even on the coast. Okay, so we'll speak a little bit more about that type of loan, like the same kind of loan as, uh, as for 9 11. Hurricane Sandy. I learned that this was a, a um, tropical storm, but now it was upgraded to, to a hurricane up in New York City. And up in New York City, the, 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 uh, lo, the land mass is kind of at low, at low altitude, right? So we had flooding in the subways and downtown and the parking lots and all that in the, on the coast of, of New York and New Jersey. Big event for them up there, and they weren't used to disasters like we kind of think about them here in Florida, okay? So they, uh, now they, they've done everything they can to prepare for the future, but here us Floridians, we're all prepared or we're learning how to become prepared, correct? Okay, so we'll speak a little bit more about um, disaster loan programs.
Okay. Available if a disaster event has been declared, a federal disaster, and a pre it's a presidential declaration. Okay? So you'll see the president in the news or after an event, and they will say, okay, this is a presidential declaration. It's, there's an SBA declaration as well, a governor's certification, and a secretary of agriculture declaration. So there's different types of declarations that we're going to speak about. Now, in the presidential declaration, FEMA is involved. FEMA will provide assistance to those residents, business owners, and others that are affected by a disaster. Whenever there's a presidential declaration and FEMA is involved, you want to go to the Disaster Recovery Center and register with FEMA because they'll assign a case number to you. And with that case number and this type of declaration is required for you to apply for any kind of assist assistance. So be sure if it's a declaration by the president and FEMA's involved, you want to get a case number, speak directly to FEMA before you speak to anybody else. Okay, so this is a major disaster. There's an emergency and assistance by FEMA for individuals, homeowners, and renters before you even think about a loan, okay? Public assistance in the form of state, local governments, nonprofits to repair and replace facilities and infrastructure, and then there's SPA loans. Presidential declarations, FEMA provides short-term assistance to help folks uh, get out from under bridges, so to speak, get out of the weather uh, if their home is destroyed, for example. Inspects for safe, sanitary, secure conditions, Emergency supplies are, are given out, food, water, generators, chainsaws, and provides temporary housing. So you've seen those events happen here in Florida. FEMA offers three ways to apply for disaster assistance, either online or by phone, or go to a disaster recovery center where FEMA is a coordinating agency. So you can go in person, some, some people like to deal with people on, in person, right? I work for Hewlett Packard Company. I, I learned management by walking around. I learned to, to like to speak to people directly face to face. Some of us like to do that. Now, some of us, depending on our situation, especially if you're not close to a center, you can apply online or you can call. Okay, there's an administrative declaration where FEMA is not involved or participates, also referred as an agency declaration, where the SBA administrator declares this as a disaster, a situation, if 25 homes or businesses in the county have uninsured losses of 40% of the market value. 25 homes is not much, right? That's a good threshold, that's a low threshold. Or three businesses, three, have un uninsured losses of 40% of the market value, and at least 25% of the workforce in the community will be unemployed for 90 days. Now that's a tough one to me, okay? But that's for an agency, an SBA declaration. Other types, a governor certification, secretary of agriculture, commerce, military reservist economic injury disaster loans. SBA provides economic injury disaster loans to businesses and M-R-I-E-I-D-L, military reservists, to offset loss of a key employee. Okay, there's different types of declarations. For example, a governor certification. I've helped counties in Tampa Bay to learn how to and where to go to speak to, to the state offices, of, of the governor's offices for disaster on what it takes to apply for a certification so that the governor can declare an event of disaster, okay? So there's ways that they need to qualify, just like I spoke to in those percentages of damage. Damage assessments before the fact. They're performed at the request of the state governor, 
determines whether an event qualifies for a federal disaster aid, a presidential declaration where FEMA and SBA are involved, or administrative declaration. So there's an assessment made before a declaration is made. Now, where do you get help after a disaster? We spoke about FEMA, where you, and you get SBA low interest loans through the government's primary form of long-term recovery for residential and business damages. Okay, as I mentioned, these loan programs are direct loans from the federal government, not guaranteed by, by SBA like our SBA loan programs are. However, those things that I mentioned about collateral, money in the bank, uh, ability to repay the loans, credit, and those things do come into play. So if you, and I'm sure all of you are in, in good uh, financial condition, we call it being bankable, being able to apply for financing and qualify for the most part. And um, those kind of situations that come up, if you're bankable, you're able to apply for all these loan programs. Okay, other assistance at the disaster recovery centers that you'll see the American Red Cross. You'll see other agencies there. You'll see other nonprofits there. And SBA will provide the long-term recovery funds and loans. State and FEMA will help communities rebuild the infrastructure. And state, FEMA, and SBA work together for those that need the help after an event. So how do you apply for FEMA assistance? If you're not able to get to the FEMA Disaster Recovery Center, then you can apply online at the FEMA website. You can apply for assistance from FEMA directly by calling FEMA on the telephone or apply again in person at the Disaster Recovery Center where FEMA is located. This is a FEMA website. So you just go to apply for assistance. So if there's ever an event, you want to review the FEMA website for that. And what are the requirements, what are the steps, and how to go ahead and ask for assistance. Now this is before you apply for loans, right? So you can get the assistance that you need. This is our website. Hey, there's a couple of ways that you can uh, go to our website, okay? And you can have a, a link, direct link on the, on the page of the SBA website. Or you can go to this drop down menu under loans and grants and look up disaster loan programs. So when you put the cursor on there, you will have a drop down menu automatically come down. Okay? So if you are, uh, anybody here building on the SBA website lately? Okay, good. This is an opportunity to get on there. It's the best website we've ever had, okay? And you can learn a lot. Now, I have had to, to, to say that this will tell you about SBA programs, okay? And also training. This is now called, instead of counseling and training, it's online resources. And then you go to a training button on that page and you can get online training. You register, you can get free online training 24-7, and it's fantastic training on contracting, on preparing for a loan, on preparing for federal government certification, on many, many topics. Okay, so visit our website and go to that online uh, resources and go to online training, okay? Very, very high quality training. So this is our website. So what's our role? Now this picture is of a tornado damage in Alabama. It looks like Charlie, right? Anybody experience Charlie? Okay, now Rick spoke about Charlie. That looks like the recovery center where FEMA was located in Punta Gorda. The agency sent down our representatives from our disaster centers to assist clients with loan applications, counseling, and guidance, and guidance to walk them through the process, okay? 
However, they also sent me down there for a month in between four hurricanes. If you remember that year, there were four hurricanes that summer, three that went right over the center of Florida. And these uh, hurricanes interrupted my assistance. I was working with the Disaster Recovery Center personnel for all of our other loan programs, okay? And all of our other assistance programs and small business programs. So we, SBA, will send out local staff to any place where there's a, a disaster and our disaster recovery personnel go to and we'll complement their effort in everything that they do, okay? But these kind of centers are easy to find if you go to the website. If you're involved locally, you'll know where they are located, okay? So, the centers for assistance are located throughout the country. We have Sacramento Field Operations West. We have Atlanta Field Operations East. Dallas-Fort Worth, where all the loans are processed and the money is dispersed for your loan application. And then our headquarters, Atlanta Field Operations, that is located in, in Herndon, Virginia, actually, and Washington, D.C. is the main headquarters locations. So it's different, just like your business or any other business or the federal government, our agencies, they all have continuation of operations plan. So does disaster. So if one center is affected, we're not, they're not, they can't operate, it's the, the work that they do is covered and another one of our locations takes their place and assumes that workload to help people in the situation, okay? So we'll speak a, a little bit more about that topic. Here's the field operations centers, and they, again, are, are dividing the country up into two different areas. So there is a disaster, then one of these centers, either on the east or the west of the Mississippi River, then will be involved in the recovery effort. And they will deploy staff, as I mentioned, to those locations, conduct preliminary damage assessments, respond to congressional inquiries, because a lot of those happened during that time, and, and do a PR work, public information. We have an officer come down from Washington in Punta Gorda, and we were at Edison College, and we were advising the community and the programs. So what I like about the city of St. Petersburg is they allow us to speak to these programs in advance instead of waiting for, for an event to happen and people are rushing to find out about the programs. Okay, so this is a great, great uh, a venue, location for us to speak about these programs so that you can become a better prepared for a recovery effort, okay? For your business to survive. Process and disbursements. Fort Worth, Texas includes loan application processing, closing documents, and loan disbursements. So everybody goes through Fort Worth, Texas, which is a huge center where they sent all SBA staff to get trained on how to process SBA disaster loans. Customer service center, okay, this is where you will go to to respond to customer inquiries. This is where you can respond to customer inquiries about our programs, by telephone, by email, we have an answer desk, a contracting assistance center website, and outreach calls, okay? And they will, you will learn if you are not in a situation where you can get on the internet, because we were speaking about, okay, what if uh, internet services are out, okay? You can call, or you can text, get information and guidance on any, of, any part of the process for SBA loans, loan applications, locations of recovery centers, and so forth. Okay, so that, and that's where you also follow up for your loan applications, which is unusual. Sometimes you, your applications or your efforts get lost in the mail, and those, there's no status. So you can check on your loan applications in these different kind of ways. Okay, our disaster loans, or federal government's primary form of long-term recovery financing and available to homeowners, renters, so you don't have to own a home for personal property, okay? Businesses of all sizes, not just small businesses, and private 
nonprofit organizations. Okay, so it's not just for small businesses a lot like a lot of SBA programs are. You have to be a small business and qualify as a small business. This program is there to assist all kinds of businesses. Well, these kinds of businesses, okay, so size does not matter. Okay, to repair, replace disaster, damage, real estate, and personal property, not covered by insurance or other forms of recovery. Provide businesses with necessary working capital until normal operations resume. There's also what's called bridge loans, where SBA funds and the state administers with organizations to provide these bridge loans between the time that you need the money and you get loan disbursement from SBA or other forms of assistance. So it's called bridge loans. And to mitigate against future disaster damage. That means so you can borrow money to prepare your facility or your home for future events, like um, storm shutters, like seawalls. So you're preparing for future events, much like you are with your disaster recovery plans. Okay? Disaster loans are physical damage for homeowners, renters, and businesses to repair, replace disaster damage, real estate, and personal property. You don't have to be a homeowner you can get loans to, to for your personal property damage. Okay, economic injury. Businesses and non, private nonprofit organizations to assist with financial obligations until they recover from the disaster. So, disaster loans or low interest rates loans to repair, replace damaged property or, uh, and, and real estate. And who can apply? We covered that already. Individuals and businesses of any size only eligible small businesses can apply for economic injury disaster loans. Okay? So that is the one rule for being a small business, for economic injury. Okay, and here are the loan limits. If you're a homeowner, you can get a loan for $200,000 for damage to your home. Personal property, $40,000. Now when Charlie happened, in Tampa, we were asked to evacuate Tampa, right? So I evacuated to Lakeland. So what happened? Charlie came in right on Punta Gorda and went right over Lakeland. But the wind by that storm also caused a lot of damage way up there in, in, in Orlando. In Orlando, there were many blue tarps on, on the roofs of homes for, for years that I can remember before they had enough people uh, that were able to repair all that damage. So you never can tell about these events and where, and depending on where you're located and, and, and what effect it'll have on you. Okay, so we had personal property damage. Businesses, $2 million maximum on the disaster loan programs. Includes real estate, business contents, and economic injury. Okay, loan maturities can be up to 30 years. Okay, 30 years. The actual loan amount is based on the uncompensated disaster loss. Now, uncompensated disaster loss means uh, not, uh, it, it takes into account if you're gonna be reimbursed by your insurance companies or by other programs available to you from the government or other sources. Because the government does not want people to be making a profit off our disaster loan programs, okay? And most of you can sympathize with that because who's paying for these disaster loans? We are, right? So that's why there's, there's scrutiny in the process to when people apply for disaster loans. Okay, military reservists, disaster loans. For small businesses, when an essential employee is called up to active duty, then they qualify for this kind of loan. Military reservists, disaster loans. Okay. SBA loans, the advantages, they're low interest. Now today, low interest are very low, right? We have some loan programs like for facilities, our 504 loan program, that are fixed term, fixed, in, fixed uh, interest rates for up to 40% of the loan at today's low fixed interest rates. So it's the best time to get a facility loan. Now, I'm not gonna wish a disaster on us, but if there was one, you'd take advantage of the low interest rates 
that are in effect right now. Flexible terms, up to 30 years, and payment can start a few months after, after you are disbursed the money so you can get that business back on the ground and operating. But again, if you have a plan, you kept your business operating, okay? Okay, that's a big advantage. You'll still be doing business with the governments, the cities, the counties, the state, your regular customers. So the better you're prepared, you're going to have an advantage in that area. You're going to have advantage over your competitors, okay? You're going to have an advantage. So up no upfront fees or prepayment penalties. Okay, loan approval. Cash flow lender. Just like our, our business loans, cash flow means that the government is going to uh, uh, be expecting to receive a loan payment from you every month. And that's why they review your cash flow statement. So, so see if you have that ability to pay that loan every month. So that's what cash flow lenders mean, payment every month. Credit history must be deemed satisfactory, okay? Satisfactory, now, depending on the conditions of the environment, the economics, and, and the locations, satisfactory can take on, and this loan programs may be different than your, your, your uh, uh, business loans, okay? But credit on our business loans, the credit is checked for the business owner, the spouse, and partners of 20% or more owners of the company. Okay, so credit is critical. That's part of staying bankable, okay? So you wanna be able to stay bankable and have good credit. Good personal credit and uh, good credit for your business, which is primary how you pay your bills to your suppliers, right? Your Dun & Bradstreet number and so forth. Okay, a lack of collateral is not a consideration in SBA's credit determination, okay? In other words, a lack of, if you don't have enough collateral or any collateral, you can still get an SBA loan, including disaster loans. But if you have some, you're obliged to, to pledge it, and we'll cover that some more. So by law, SBA loans are limited to uncompensated disaster losses and recoveries from other sources. Okay, the reasons why you might be declined for an SBA loan, if you are, lack of repayment ability, so you, you'll need to have those financial statements ready, which businesses like yourselves, you already have, right? You have your financial statements, you have your cash flow statements, your forecast for the next three years, showing that you're making a profit, okay, that you're able to handle those loan payments, okay? Okay, another reason, as I said, credit, you have good credit history. And if you have unsatisfactory experience on federal debt, and that includes things like education loans, okay? So you have to have been paying that loan off, the student loan, in a good manner. Also, failure to maintain required flood insurance on a previous SBA loan where your property was, it was given as, pledged as collateral, okay? Uh, delinquent or court ordered child support. You didn't expect that one, right? So folks, uh, uh, I know that none of us are in that situation, but those are the kind of reasons why that you might be declined for a disaster loan. And failure to pledge available collateral, as I mentioned. Okay, the applicant must have an acceptable credit history and repayment ability. Terms, up to 30 years, and determining the length of the loan is determining your ability to pay that loan. May, the loan may be increased up to 20% of the verified loss for mitigation measures. Remember I mentioned mitigation, like to, to strengthen your business structure, to get uh, 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 hurricane strength garage door. Those are mit mitigation. Uh, things that you can do for the next event. And there's a $2 million limit on the combination of all loans for disaster, per disaster, okay? Collateral, required for loans, physical disaster loans over 14,000, okay? 
again, you will not be declined for lack of collateral. But if you have it, you need to pledge it. Okay? Economic injury, disaster loans, only over $5,000. They'll ask you for collateral. Okay? Collateral of you, your spouse, 20% of more owners in the business. Real estate is preferred form of collateral. Okay? So remember that, that if you borrow money to, to replace or, 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 or repair damaged real estate, then that's going to be asked for as collateral. If you own the, the, the property, okay, SBA will not decline a loan for lack of collateral, but does require for you to pledge collateral if you have it. Now these are home loans, so you can get a home loan for for damage to your home for two hundred thousand dollars maximum, personal property even if you rent for forty thousand, and you can get additional two hundred thousand to refinance your home. Okay. Now mitigation is 20% of the loss due to damage. Business loans to replace to repair real estate, machinery and equipment, furniture and fixtures, two million dollars maximum. Economic injury, two million dollars. Mitigation, again 20%. So again, the maximum combined loan amounts is two million dollars. Current interest rates at the time this slide show was put together, where no credit was available elsewhere, at those low interest rates. Okay? Those low interest rates for the different kinds of loan programs that we have. If you have the resources, the money in the bank, or the ability to get loans, you can still get an SBA guaranteed loan, but you get them at the credit available elsewhere rate. Okay? Loan restrictions, no duplication of benefits, so don't make a profit. Eligibility is restricted to losses not otherwise compensated by insurance. Now I've got to say about insurance. Um, if you have property that you own or a home and you have insurance, you're going to have an insurance policy that's covering the fair market value in many cases, correct? Fair market value. What happened in Punta Gorda was that people were insured for the fair market value, but because many of those homes or structures were built before the new building codes in 1995 or six, I remember, the cost to replace those structures was higher than the fair market value. Okay, so always look at the replacement cost for the amount of the insurance that you're going to get, either for your home or your personal property or your business. So think about replacement costs and not fair market value. That's just a hint that I ran across because I was uh, uh, speaking to a lot of clients there, and uh, their loan amounts that they were asking for was for fair market value, but that's not really what they needed because of the new construction building codes. Okay. Applicants not complying with the terms of previous loan uh, uh, restrictions or agreements are not eligible. Hobby businesses are not eligible. For home loans, primary res residence, and extended family. Okay? Disaster purchases of disaster damaged property are not eligible. We're not here so that folks can, can make a profit. Of it. We're here to help for, for the recovery. You make a profit by selling your product or services to your customers, like the city of St. Petersburg, okay, and others. Refinancing is only offered to create repayment ability of the disaster loan. We do not offer debt consolidation. For businesses, SBA may refinance loans on real estate or machinery and equipment if the applicant has substantial damage, okay, which is 40% or more of the properties on their pre-disaster fair market value or replacement cost of the real estate, including the value of any land. Whichever is less or 50% or more of the pre-disaster fair market value or replacement cost of the real estate, excluding the value of the land, which, whichever is less. 
liens eligible for refinancing on homes and business loans, equipment, equipment liens. So you have liens, UCC ones, I believe it's UCC ones, okay, for equipment where, where you still don't, are, don't have the title to that equipment. So you usually have a lien, a UCC one that you have to file on that. Relocation, any type of move from the disaster damaged property if it's mandatory and voluntary, the, the applicant either elects to move or is required to move from a damaged property to another location. By law, SBA cannot provide assistance to applicants who choose to voluntarily relocate outside the business area where the, that disaster occurred. That happened a lot in, in New Orleans, where people decided, I'm out of here. I'm going to go somewhere else and start a business instead of preparing to come back to the same location and rebuild their business or home, okay? So it depends if you voluntarily leave, relocate without the intent of coming back, there's no assistance available to you, okay? Eligibility is based on the replacement cost of the disaster damaged property. Relocation requests can be made anytime during the loan process. Any purchase agreement, contract for sale or lease should be made subject to written SBA approval. If you have a loan, on that property or your home, then you need approval from SBA to sell that property, okay? If you're still paying off on that loan. Insurance requirements, remember I spoke about, about replacement, replacement value and not fair market value. Borrowers must obtain and maintain appropriate insurance as a condition of most secure loans. So if you borrow money for business or homes, the, it's going to be, that property is going to be the collateral and perhaps other things. But the government is going to require you to have hazard insurance, sewer backup, windstorm, earthquake, flood insurance. Flood insurance uh, in, in special flood hazard areas. Now recently there were these areas determined where there was going to be higher interest, I mean higher insurance rates, right? So if folks are, or I heard that if folks were planning to buy a home, that that's one of the critical things they wanted to look at is am I in, a, in one of these flood zones where I'm going to be charged a lot more insurance costs, okay? So that's one thing to consider <clears throat> in the special flood hazard areas. Uh, same thing happened in, well, New Orleans was definitely, those inundated areas were definitely in a flood zone, right? So a lot of these things are taken into consideration for our, our disaster loan programs. Deadlines for physical disaster damage, whether it's an earthquake, a flood, a fire, a hurricane, or whatnot, any damage after the declaration, you have 60 days to apply for a loan, okay? From the date of the declaration whether you're in the process of working with FEMA or another agency, uh, you need to be cognizant of the fact that you have 60 days from the date of that application. For economic injury, like 9-11, like the oil spill, where you're not directly affected with damage, you have nine months from the date of declaration, okay? Now you can go to our website and you can look for those dates. You can look for the local centers that are there to assist you with applying for a loan or the status of your application. But once you look at these deadlines, you wanna be sure that you apply if you intend to apply. So FEMA may extend the filing deadline uh, for a presidential declaration and SBA usually extends as well. So applying for a loan, you can do it electronically at this website. Okay, your paper application, after you register with FEMA, if FEMA is involved, in person at our recovery centers, and these more forms can be gotten on our website. So you have everything you, 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 you need to apply by on, online, by mail, or in person, okay? So this is, just a slide on the application process, a website, a phone number. Oh, 
and email. So make it as easy as possible for folks that are in this process, because it's a traumatic time for businesses, for homeowners uh, that, that cannot relocate to their homes, as Rick said. And people will not let you go back to your homes because there's power outage or, or damage to infrastructure where it's not safe, uh, living conditions are not good. So you don't know how long it's gonna take for you to be able to relocate back to your, to your home or business location. Now again, if you're still operating your business, once you evacuate and you've taken all those efforts to, to maintain your records, whether it's in the cloud or on a disk, if it's an insurance uh, policy that you can fax to yourself and put it on disk or mail it, email it to yourself, it's out there somewhere, okay? You need to take those steps beforehand so that you'll be ready to apply for a loan application, okay? And I'll cover more information of what it takes. Now, the application process, you can go to our website. Now, if you see an event starting to happen or a hurricane's gonna hit the day after tomorrow or tomorrow, go to our website or any time where you don't have anything else to do like today, you can go to our website and look at the frequently asked questions for disaster loans, right? Uh, then you can call our number or you can email questions to SBA and then you complete the loan application, okay? And then you can still call SBA before you mail that off for, for mailing applications. At any point in time, you're able to ask questions and get assistance. So applying for a loan, there's no contract bids or estimates needed because SBA will verify the damage, okay? No need to request a specific amount. And we encourage applicants to complete a loan application even if insurance claim has not yet been settled. <coughs> and we help folks, applicants, on the disaster process. That's where they send folks like myself and our disaster loan staff um, to those areas that are affected. And trust me, there is an event happening in, at any point in time around the country. Okay, so you hear about all this, those fires in California, tornado in Oklahoma, a drought, a hurricane, an earthquake somewhere. Whenever there's a, a disaster, SBA is going to be involved. Okay. Okay. Again, more on the loan application process. Loss, loss verification, SBA completes an on-site inspection of the damages. It's like having a car accident. They'll come on and look at the damage that occurred. Loan processing, SBA performs a repayment analysis of your financial statements, your credit, and sets the terms and conditions of the loan. Loan closing, SBA prepares and issues legal documents for the borrower to review and sign off on, and disbursement, SBA disperses the funds. Incrementally to fund recovery, okay? Okay, so you're going to get the help. Now, the loan process is not like, here's my loan application, and we'll see if it gets approved. As I said, it's a kind of an ongoing process where SBA will come and determine the amount of damage, uh, work with you on your recovery by insurance, uh, benefits, and so forth. So it's not like uh, you may have, your loan application may be received in Fort Worth, but the process is still not yet complete because of what I've been speaking about. So decisions, there was no obligation for a borrower to accept the loan once you're approved. And if you, if you refuse a loan, you have up to six months to request reinstatement on the loan application, on that same loan application. You don't have to reapply again, okay? If SBA determines the applicant cannot financially support additional debt or cannot be approved, they may be referred for possible addition to FEMA, presidential declarations, and other local assistance programs. What does that mean? If you cannot get a loan, and if there's money available that the government makes, so we have a determination on which government is in place, right? And which governments are gonna provide money in case you cannot apply for a loan, if you don't qualify for a loan. There may be other monies available determined on, this determined by the budget and, and the federal government, okay? So can I appeal? Yes. Within six months of the original date that you were declined, so you have to keep track of all the dates 
mailed everything, uh, uh, certified mail, return receipt, and so forth. Keep track of all those dates, okay? When you mail your, your, uh, your uh, appeal to Fort Worth, Texas. And it's gotta be a good reason why, uh, any additional reasons why you think that your appeal should be taken into consideration. Don't just say, well, I think I should have this loan, and here's my request, okay? So, this is your go box that Rick spoke a lot about in a disaster situation. Copy of key contracts for business administration. Phone system, remote access passwords, uh, your voicemail, so you can leave messages for your employees, okay? So you have a system and you leave a message for your employee and they can call in, okay, a certain extension or phone number and get your instructions to your employees. Communications is one of the toughest things in a disaster evacuation because a lot of times they say that only text will work because the, the uh, internet's not working, uh, telephone lines are not working and so forth. So one time uh, we had an, uh, uh, a, a, an SBA um, practice run at a, a recovery of our programs, and they gave us a phone for satellite communications. And they said, okay, this is the time that the drill starts to see if you can get in touch with headquarters by satellite phone. But they forgot that it took four hours to charge that phone. By the time I received it, I was not supposed to have any power Okay, so there's all sorts of, to, to charge that phone, okay? There's all sorts of issues that you have, especially with communications. Uh, local number to leave information, insurance policies and contract information. Like I said, you don't have to take the hard copy with you, or you can mail it off somewhere, put in a logbox if it's, if it's a watertight logbox, or you can fax it to yourself and it'd be in the cloud somewhere in the system. Fax yourself a copy of those contracts, the policy. Continuation of operations business continuity plan. You want everybody to know, as Rick said, what the plan is, what the employees are gonna do, how to keep them safe, and suppliers. Be sure that an event happens that you have backup suppliers, okay? You have a contingency plan for everything. Okay, plan A and plan B, okay? So don't just depend on one step. It says, okay, this was not in my plan. I have nothing that I can do about it. Have backup plans for each step. Okay, uh, list of suppliers, vendors, emergency vendors, so emergency payroll procedures and cash on hand, right, to pay the employees. Or when an ATM machine does not work, you wanna be able to have that cash on hand. Okay, backup files, tapes, or servers of electronic data in the cloud, video, picture equipment inventory of assets. How many of us have a picture, a video, a serial number, model number of our television sets at home? Insurance companies are gonna require that, they're gonna ask you for that when they reimburse you for damage when that television is underwater or damaged. So the same thing with any other uh, thing, pro personal property you have at home, or a list of your business inventory, or a list of your business equipment, your computers, your fax machine, anything that you can, that you're gonna be able to, if you wanna be able to claim that on, on an insurance policy, you wanna have pictures, videos, serial numbers, model numbers, and whatnot to be able to claim that. So just remember that a lot of folks, don't, they just think, okay, I'm gonna cover my computer with a trash bag and I'm out of here. But do you have that kind of information for insurance purposes? Okay. County, city, businesses, licenses, and certifications. That's why you're here, right? You wanna protect that record that you're certified by the city of St. Petersburg so you can be on their bidder's mailing list. Any city certifications, county, state, and federal government contracting certifications, you want to have copies of those certification programs. Your certifications are critical. If the state wants to buy something from you and I don't have a certification, 
They should have a copy of your certification, but you want to be able to present that when you bid on a contract and an opportunity. Okay? And uh, all certifications are different. Wherever you're going to do business, you want to have a cert you want to be involved in what is the certification a requirement for that customer okay and that customer location and many people will accept certain certifications and and some they will not so learn about those certifications for your business facility uh, uh, facility as rick said sometimes they won't let you back to your home or your place of business you want to have authorized peasant memos ID badges or whatnot say, I've got to get into the office for this reason. Or you allowing employees to get into this building um, and I can go to the second floor and, and look at damage to my facility or for whatever reason. But you want to be able to access your facilities as well as your home, hopefully. Okay, disaster loan documentation. Sole proprietors should have a copy of your current financial statements, profit and loss. Not older than 90 days, preferably. So if you update your financial statements, also back them up. Okay. Balance, uh, balance sheet copy, cash flow statement, inventory listing, schedule of liabilities, in other words, accounts payable and so forth, a copy of required licenses, certifications, uh, professional licenses. I know many of you are professionals in the state, uh, for the most part, states has requirements for you to have those licenses and certifications. You want to have those handy or in a toolbox that you can take with you or at least fax to yourself so for somewhere where you can access your, your uh, storage uh, location. Okay, and copy of last three years tax returns with schedules. Okay, if it's a new business, copies of any that you have filed. Okay, a new business for SBA purpose, the lenders, uh, a new business is a startup or a business that does not have two, the first two years tax returns for their business. Okay? That's considered a startup or a new business. After two years, after you have copies of the first two years of business tax returns, that you're considered an existing business. And it makes a big difference, to, especially to lenders, okay, for, for loan purposes. So keep all that information uh, protected. Now, corporations and partnerships should have last copy of last three years tax returns with schedules and one year personal tax return on principals, partners, and so forth. Okay, owners of 20% or more. Profit and loss statement, inventory schedule, liabilities, balance sheet, copy of all required licenses, certifications. <coughs> now, they'll also ask you to fill out, a, for example, a statement of financial net worth. Okay, personal. Okay, so that's your, your, your assets minus your liabilities is your net worth, right? That show how you've paid credit and obligations in the past and how you've handled those, those credit and, and business and monetary decisions in the past, okay? And they're also looking for assets that don't have a lien on them that you've paid off or investments to ask for as collateral, okay? So these are some of the things that they'll ask you for the website, other useful websites. We have, I don't know how, you, uh, I think the copy that I saw of this presentation, you quite did not could, could read these websites. But in addition to SBA and FEMA, you have ready.gov, disastersafety.org, floridadisaster.org, disaster preparedness, prepare my business, and SBA. And if that fails, there's a copy of a newspaper out here in the table where you can look at preparing for a disaster, okay? Anyway, so, so again, uh, the, the advantages to the city of St. Petersburg is that you'll be a better prepared business, just like because some of these uh, certification programs will require you to be bankable, to have those licenses and certifications, especially for those construction type businesses or even if the other types of businesses. So you want to be prepared, you want to be bankable, you want to be able to survive a disaster, keep operating, come back, help with the recovery, and make a profit. So that's the reason why you're here, right? Okay, well, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I want to wish you good luck in your business uh, planning. Okay, thank you.
Thank you.